I wanted to start off this whole conversation with what's happening with censorship. Uh, we see Facebook was in trouble. Trump is calling out Google and pointing certain things out. I mean, how bad is censorship right now? And why should people be worried about censorship? I mean, when you look at uh, so-called private companies, and uh, there's really nothing private about them. I mean, you talk about these companies who uh, are really behaving like public utilities in a large sense, okay, that they need to be broken apart. And they're out there. These are companies that have gotten, you know, taxpayer subsidiary, you know, sub subsidies. Uh, they're the ones who've gotten regulations and uh, licensure that have been waived in order for them to uh, exist. And then they've had regulations and the legislations put in place to make sure that any sort of competitor could re could not really challenge them. And when you have that sort of a monopoly in place, censorship becomes a very, very dangerous thing. That unless we as the public at large begin to rapidly and with courage and boldly with vigor and vim and not with laziness and, uh, you know, you know, being caught in some sort of rote or routine, stay where we are, but with vigor and vim, move to alternative platforms, be willing to put our time, our talent, our treasure with the creators, the content purveyors that we like and that we adhere to who share our viewpoints, unless we are willing to back them up wholeheartedly, then we're all going to be victimized by the Scroogles of the world, the, the YouTubes and the Twits that are running the show. These Silicon Valley mavens, Dave, that you know, at one time, you go to Silicon Valley, you launch a company, you do very well, you become a success. All you wanted was a big house, uh, some fast cars, a yacht, and uh, that's all you wanted. Nowadays, the Silicon Valley mavens, they, that's not enough for them anymore. The, 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 the money, the wealth, the fame, that's not enough. They, they want the power, Dave. They want to sit at the throne, at the foot of the throne of tyranny and eat from the table of tyrants and that's where we are today dave and that's why we need to move tyranny you know what that whole blowback with trump trump is going to do something i really feel it in my bones and dave i know you do it as well um i feel it in my bones man this, this <laughs> i think uh i think the social media companies i think silly con that's what i like to call them dave silly con mm -hmm. valley because they are silly uh, has really stepped on a landmine with the censorship of not only just Alex Jones, but any sort of dissenting voice that's out there. I think they stepped on, and I think uh, not only is Trump's going to move against them, but the majority of the American people is going to move along and get rid of these guys, man. I think it's uh, it's high time that this happens. You think eventually that these companies, will they be regulated? Or do you think there'll be like an Internet Bill of Rights? I mean, I know there's a petition up right now on the WhiteHouse.gov for that. But do you think eventually is that? I mean, when you look at it this way, right, when 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 these companies are such a part of our lexicon, I mean, think about it, right? Oh, go look it up on the Internet. Where are you going to go? Google. In fact, the word Google it has become part of our lexicon. Why don't you go Google that? I mean, isn't that crazy? I mean, isn't that crazy? I mean, yeah. there was one time where it, it, it's so prevalent that a company practically owns search. Nobody goes to you, Dave, and says, hey, Dave, why don't you go Bing it? <laughs> why don't you go Yahoo that one, Dave? <laughs> you know, why don't you look it up on AOL? Nobody does that. Everybody tells you to go Google it. And that's the problem. You, you know, these companies can't say that they're private companies. And then go ahead and start censoring and banning and doing all these things. Because if you're a media platform that you're a private company and you're going out and censoring and doing all these other things, then at that point, my friend, you are a publisher because you are curating what I can see and what I cannot see through censure. And that means that you fall under a completely different dictum and you shouldn't have gotten all these taxpayer subsidiaries. You shouldn't have gotten all these uh, regulation, uh, you know, uh, laxing of regulations and 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 uh, and licensure. Um, it's a different ball game. And then there's a whole bunch of legal ramifications as to that because these are content creators who are putting their intellectual property 
on your platform and you're curating it and that's not how it works so yeah i think regulation it's it's going to come down i think it's going to come down hard on these guys yeah i i think that's where they're they're trying to move this whole thing towards. And I think this is why uh, Trump started to do this with Google. And we know that Facebook got in trouble for, you know, selling information, even though they say they, they really didn't, but they did. Dave, did um, you hear about Yahoo this morning? No. What about Yahoo? Yahoo? It's come out this morning that Yahoo and AOL, after getting in trouble for selling customer data, right, it came out today that they're still doing it. That Yahoo is still skimming through the, you know, the tens of people. Now, I didn't say tens of thousands, Dave, but I said the tens of people that still have Yahoo emails. They're skimming through those emails looking for receipts, purchases, things of that sort to sell that data without their email clientele knowing or being alerted to to third parties. And this is the problem. You see this, just like you said, with Facebook as well. It's terrible. They don't stop. They they can't help it because we're the merchandise. That is true. I, I wanted to move the discussion over to the Inspector General report, the FISA, Clinton emails, and, you know, this feud between Sessions and Trump. Uh, what's the game here? I mean, I mean are we ever going to uh, hear the truth? Is this all going to come out? I know Trump has been tweeting a lot but uh, about all of this, but... Do you, do you think it's almost time where this is actually actually going to hit mainstream? Here's the deal. I, I think I really feel this, Dave. And if 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 it doesn't happen, I'll be surprised. But I think going into the midterm elections, I think uh, I think some big news is going to pop from now and going into the midterms. Because I think something so huge and heinous is going to start really erupting out from the surface and into the limelight where it simply cannot be ignored. Okay, we, we you know, look at what happened. The fact that Hillary Clinton's 33,000 emails save for two, all 33,000 of them wound up on a on a server that was siphoned to a Chinese company that is based in Northern Virginia, a Chinese front company that is owned by the Chinese government. Top secret information was on there. The fact that, you know, most experts are saying this was not a hack. This was simply just willfully taken. And that's one of the theories that I postulated years ago when the whole Hillary Clinton server scandal started coming out is that, that she willingly, that this was an operation that she willingly put it there saying, oh, well, look, I got hacked. But she was selling secrets. There's no doubt about it. Okay, selling secrets. And the fact that this information has come out and the fact that the FBI is denying that, hey, you know, what, the, there's the, there's the Hillary Clinton server did not get hacked. The fact that they did not even look, they did not even look at uh, uh, Anthony Weiner's uh, uh, laptop and all the tens of thousands of emails that are on Weiner's laptop. They haven't even looked at that, Dave. It is something that is remarkable, and I think something's going to happen that's going to demoralize the far left. It's going to demoralize, um, you know, the entire establishment. And I think we're going to see a red wave, a red wave and a blue sprinkle, my friend. So who has uh, Wiener's laptop? Um, and do we know who has Wiener's laptop or uh, Clinton's server? We know that the FBI has Wiener's laptop. And all the files that were in that laptop were copied and held in possession with the NYPD. And from what I heard is that the NYPD has given it to the white hats or the quote-unquote good guys uh, that are in government. That is what I've heard uh, from multiple sources, Dave, uh, some very close and some that are even in working in government itself have uh, have said that to me that um, – that they, in fact, do have the data. Uh, I mean, look, look, look at the indictment count, man. 45,000 indictments, sealed indictments, and, and, and growing. It, it, it's, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, a typical presidential, uh, you know, uh, term, you'll have uh, 500 indictments, maybe 1,200 at the most. That's it. Nobody sits around and has 45,000 indictments sealed. Yeah. That's yeah. some sort of a mass arrest event coming, and you cannot deny that. You know, something's something's afoot here, Dave. Something's afoot, and I think it's I think it's for the positive. 
Yeah, I think it's for the positive, too. And, and I've noticed that Trump has been tweeting out quite a bit about Bruce or about Clinton, about all of this. I, I don't know if he's foreshadowing or he's getting the public ready for all of this. But when it does hit, those people that are sleeping, those people that haven't been following, who've been rejecting it all this time, uh, are you nervous about, you know, people rioting Antifa uh, and groups like that, you know, trying to push you know, uh, some type of, you know, civil war in America? Well, the, the the specter of civil discord and civil unrest and civil war is always there. But I think what's going to happen is going to be something more than just, oh, Hillary Clinton sold secrets. I think in order for the air to come out of the opposition, in order for the um, the mass amount of... of, of this you know oppressor versus oppressed nonsense that is come that that the uh, that the uh, you know the far left opposition feeds on. In order for that to go, something that is so horrific, so heinous, so dare I use the word evil, has to come to the surface. That if you choose to defend it, you yourself are throwing in your cards. You yourself are throwing in your your hat in the ring with some of the most evil, heinous acts in human history. And I think the propensity for that is very true. So the way you stop civil war from happening is you don't make it about politics anymore. You bring it down to the very core essence of humanity, and that is good versus evil. I think the truths that are about to come out, Dave, I think they supersede politics. I think they supersede, um, you know, s- s- this typical left and right wing rhetoric. I think we're entering into an era where it is going to cut to the core of who we are as humanity. What is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil. And there will be such a moral outrage that any brain-dead, twisted member of Pantifa would be terrified to death to even stand in opposition to the outrage that the American public would feel. And I think that that is a very strong possibility um, come this fall, Dave. I think it's pretty serious because let's be honest, the, the 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 presidency cannot afford cannot afford to lose the house and the cannot afford to do that but it has to be an overwhelming victory and the, you know some big news in order for an overwhelming victory to occur a major piece of demoralizing deflating defeatist information and truth will and should be coming out that absolutely hamstrings the opposition. I think that's what we're headed to. I think there's a strong possibility of that, Dave. And do you think this is going to come before the elections? you think they're going to uh, put this out there before that time? Yep, I think so. I think so. And I think it's going to be so earth-shattering. I think it's going to be so huge that you simply cannot ignore it. You simply cannot go to a voting booth with your finger going towards Democrat without stopping and pausing and then switching to Republican or Independent or Libertarian. Because I think what is going to happen, it has to happen before the midterms. Now, if if nothing happens, Dave, I'll tell you right now, here's panic mode. People want to say, hey, V, what's the worst case scenario? Worst case scenario is this, okay? And the and and we're you know I I've stopped giving timelines a long time ago because I think right now we're in the stage of the game where everything right now is event driven right. If we go to the voting booths in November for the midterms and we vote, and the next thing you know there was a quote and I don't think it's going to happen, but if it does, a blue wave, a a sweep of the House and Senate, and it becomes filled with de- with Democrats. Okay, it becomes filled with Democrats. Uh, the president, the the president and his party loses the House and the Senate. None of the bad news comes out. 
then we are in a whole heap of trouble. Then the freedom-loving people should start really panicking because then this real specter of civil war raises its ugly head. Uh, battle lines will be drawn, and there will be people considering how do I exit stage stage right? How do I get my family out of harm's way? And then we're back in the the, the type of panic mode, the type of of of, uh, of of vigilance and emergency state of situation that we were all in, Dave, under the Obama administration. I remember those days of 2015. 2016. I mean, we're biting our nails, man. You know, I'm like, oh my god, this man is yeah. this man's gonna wreck the country. When is the ICBM gonna land on top of my house? You know, it's just it was just like that. I think uh, that level of panic will be very real. So that's why this midterm election, folks, is super super important. Let's switch subjects to uh, what's happening out in North Korea, the Middle East, and why Trump decided to uh, keep Pompeo from going to North Korea. I mean, he was supposed to meet with Kim Jong-un and, you know, talk about peace. And all of a sudden, it was called off. And we see, uh, I think it was today, where Trump is saying, listen, you know, we're going to continue with drills. We're going to do whatever we have to do. And we don't care what North Korea says. Uh, Is this, are, are we moving towards war? Or what is he doing here? I think it's posturing. It's more tough negotiations. Uh, from what I heard in the background is that uh, the, the the trade spate uh, that has uh, happened and that has occurred between the United States and China, uh, China has uh, some sort of uh, 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 alternative deal that they're trying to strike with the North Koreans that it doesn't have, uh, I guess, the best interests of all parties in mind. And uh, that is why we're walking back or appears to be walking back uh, the deal. So uh, for those of, uh, out there that are saying that this North Korean deal is done, it's over, it's, you know, it's, it's a lost cause, I would just tell everybody right now, just uh, hold still. Um, you know, don't try to count your chickens before they hatch. And uh, let's give it some time. I mean, it, I mean, it wasn't that long ago when people were thinking that Trump's going to, you know, launch a, a Minuteman missile over into Pyongyang, and uh, there will be the start and advent of World War III. And that didn't happen. It was a complete reversal. It was a major uh, geopolitical uh, uh, diplomatic win. And I think uh, this is the same thing. I think there's a, uh, you know, some there's some tough negotiation because it's just not North Korea that we're dealing with out there. I think it's uh, it's also China. And um, and 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 trying to work between these two powers for the what's best and what's fair and what's equitable for everybody involved, uh, I think that's the that's the bigger that's the bigger play here. Trump exchanges letters with Kim Jong Un. Why are they going back to paper and pen or typewritten letters? Why aren't they using you know the phone? Why aren't they using electronic communications? Why are they exchanging letters back and forth? Because it's intimate and it's romantic. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> now, I mean, we all know. We all know why. I mean, think about it. This is why I said, let's just wait and see, right? Because, you know, Trump has been communicating with Un via paper. Trump has been communicating with Putin via paper and pen. Why? Because if you know anything about Donald Trump and being a New Yorker, okay, folks don't realize this. Trump's never used email. From the time he was a a real estate mogul here in, in Manhattan, the guy delivered messages via paper, via you know uh, message courier services, the bike messengers that we have running around, pedaling all over the place in New York, cutting you off and jumping in front of the uh, the the kebab carts over here. You know, it's that's how he's always been doing it. But it's also brilliant in the sense that number two, that you're not leaving a digital paper trail. So in other words, the deep state backstabbers, the deep state uh, near do wells that are inhabiting the White House, that are inhabiting, you know, Washington D.C., the haunt of 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 demonic miscreants that are there in D.C., it avoids them. This way, Trump can c- get his ideas conveyed very closely and very concisely and very clearly with those involved without any of this hacking and leaking that are happening. So, folks, 
Trump is playing his cards close to the chest. You're you're not going to, you know, you know things that all people are. <clears throat> I mean, haven't we learned already not to have a knee jerk reaction with this with this administration, right? I mean, I've been guilty of it. Ah, this guy's going to screw everything up. And then, like, oh, okay, <laughs> all right, so everything's fine. Everything's fine. It's, it's fantastic. It's fine. It's fine. Okay, good. That I think that's the attitude that I think people need to have is is a is a wait and see attitude. Okay. Um, oftentimes we're so obsessed with our, our, our dogma and folks, we, we're not in a dogmatic world. There's a lot, and literally it is, it, it is, um, uh, you know, it's such a, a, an often abused term, three dimensional chess, but, um, I like to call this uh three dimensional poker and, um, that's what we're facing here. There's a lot of feints. There's a lot of fakes. There's a lot of disinfo on both sides, and I think that people need to be wise and people need to be vigilant and discerning, and most importantly, to be pragmatic and patient. I think that's the critical thing. And let let's see what pay, what what plays out, because right now, Dave, the way I see it, everything's in flux. Everything's in flux. And I, I, like I said before, the panic mode, the panic mode happens come the midterm elections. The midterm elections come and we all lose and lose big. Then you can panic. Then you have the right to panic. You have the right to boop, 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 boop. Hello, honey. Yeah, that those plans about uh, moving to Thailand. Yeah, let, let, let's talk about that. Then you got the right to do that, right? But up until that point, let's just be patient. Let's see what plays out. Because I think, as well as you do as well, Dave, we right. both get a sense of feeling from everything that we're that we're garnering and every every source that we talk to and every person that we that that are that have their finger to the pulse on these type of things. We all get the same feeling that hey, something is brewing under the surface. I can't tell what it is or how it's going to look like, but something big is about to happen. There's no doubt about it. I agree. Uh, what about Syria? I mean, we're we're hearing information that I mean, information that's coming out right now that there's a false flag, the white helmets are involved, the terrorists are involved. They're preparing another chemical attack. Uh, is this the deep state? I mean, what what is happening there? Uh, it's definitely another deep state uh, operation. Uh, this is a uh, clandestine. This is a uh, work through other actors. Now you got folks got to understand. Um, the U.S. is not the only actor in Syria, and neither are the Syrians nor the Russians. People look at the Middle East and think it's okay. It's it's the U.S. Why doesn't the president just call back the uh, the, uh, the, the the CIA? Why can't he? Why can't he do this? Why can't he do that? People don't understand how convoluted, how corrupt and convoluted the entire setup the, of, of the Middle East and what it looks like. Folks, it's not just us that's there. You got the Saudis that are there. And when I talk to most people <clears throat> that the Saudis and the Iranians, they've been having a proxy war for the last 30, 40 some odd years. Well, the last 40 some odd years of having a proxy war. Okay. That back in 2000, uh, I think it was 2014, and I reported this on, uh, on, on Rogue Money, and I said this on my, uh, on my show. There was, back in 2014, a meeting between the Iranians and all their proxies and uh, the Saudis and then all their proxies in Algeria. And they were hammering out some of the details of what was going on with the Syrian conflict back in 2014. So you have to understand that just because the white helmets are there, quote-unquote white helmets, you can put anybody in a white helmet, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, they're all interchangeable. White helmets, you know, red crescent, yellow helmets, black scarves, whatever the hell you want to call them, they're all interchangeable, right? The question is, who is funding it? Who's behind it? Is it the Saudis? Is it the UAE, which is a major financial player in the Middle East, the United Arab Emirates? People don't know that. People don't know that the UAE, especially Dubai, people go to Dubai and Abu Dhabi and they see, oh, my God, the most beautiful real estate, these tall towers. Uh, those tall towers are there because the UAE, my friend, is the largest money laundering operation in the entire Middle East. It's the UAE. 
So who's funding these guys, these white helmets? Is it us? Is it somebody else? And why? I mean, think about this, right? Why would Mattis, okay, Mattis come out and say, hey, you know what? Uh, we, we feel a strong chance that Assad might gas his people. Which in explanation number one to most of the Kool-Aid drinkers will say, there you go, Assad's going to go gas his people again. But to those in the know, it can be a way of signaling, hey, get heads up, guys. We sense another false flag coming, right? Because let's be honest, apart from you know shooting at, a, at, 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 at empty buildings and landing missiles on the beach we haven't, and, and hitting an empty airfield, we haven't done anything in terms of Syria. We really haven't, not since this administration taken over. There hasn't been any overt anything. Everybody's been talking about overt actions in Syria, and I'm connected to a lot of Syrians that are on the ground. In fact, you know, part of my lineage going back, my mother's side is from Syria. So, based on the context that I have over there, we're not seeing any of this, 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 oh my God, there's a force flag coming, the U.S. is involved. Hold on. Hold on. Now, you might say, oh yeah, the CIA funded. What part of the CIA? Where did the funding come from? Who cut the checks? Is it us? Is it really us? Or is it a fifth column? Or is it the Saudis working with the fifth column? Or is it the Saudis and the UAE, the the Emirates, bankrolling the operation? Is is that what it is? Because they want to create a political need for us to lend our muscle unwillingly. Is that what's happening? So there's many layers to this, folks. It's not it's not black and white. And this is what people need to understand about the geostrategic game. It is not black and white. White hats, yellow hats, black hats, white helmets, yellow helmets, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Al-Nursa. Insert name here. They're all interchangeable. The fact is, where's the money coming from? Who's funding it? Who's financing it? Because it might not be us. It might not be us. So don't be so quick. How can Trump allow this? How can he allow the White Helmets back in? Maybe it wasn't Trump. Maybe it wasn't the U.S. Have you thought about the damn Saudis? Have you thought about the crooked United Arab Emirates? Have you thought about those characters? Because those are some, some of the things that people need to think about. It's a grand game, Dave. It's a grand game. But, yeah. But the fact that the information is out there, that there's some sort of a false flag, that's a good thing because the Russians warned about it as well. You know, and so now the Russians are talking about it and the U.S. is talking about it, right? That there's a there's a potential for this. So in other words, now all of a sudden these secret uh, false flag members, think, think about it. How did we all know that there are all of a sudden uh, 12 to 24 specialist individuals that have uh, appeared out of nowhere in Idlib? How do we know about that? If it were not for the fact that this information is being leaked by who? The White Hats. And one of the things that Trump has said is that our military is in constant and good communication with the Russian military. They're working hand in hand. So let not your heart be troubled. You got nothing to freak out. Don't freak out. Nothing to freak out about. Not yet. Do you think the troops are uh, going to be pulled out of Syria? I mean, Trump mentioned this a, a while back. Uh, do you think they're eventually going to be pulling the troops out? Because we could see the paid mercenary, the Islamic State, you know, Al Nusra, Al Qaeda. I mean, they're dwindling to almost nothing. Eventually, we will be pulled out. Uh, I think that would happen. People will say, "Ah, oh, you're 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 a crazy Kool Aid drinker." Blah, 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 blah. You know, and I'm like, uh, "Okay, calm it down." Uh, I, I think we will. I think we will because there's there's no need to be. But you see, we can't we can't pull out now because there's just way too many deep state actors. There's way too many things that can go wrong. So you got to understand, there's a lot of crazies in the Middle East. Okay, there's a lot of crazies. So the U.S. and the Russians are there. What people look? Here's the thing: on the surface, it looks like World War Three is going to happen. Oh my God, it's gonna it's gonna happen right now. Albert Pike. Albert Pike, Dave, he wrote about it in Morals and Dogma. He wrote about it, Dave, (laughs) back in 18, whatever, three world wars, right? Albert Pike. Hold on. 
that's on the surface. That's on the conspiratorial surface. But when you get below into the geostrategic, the fact that the U.S. and the Russians are there together, believe it or not, folks, it's a great thing. It's a good thing. It keeps the crazies from blowing up everything. It keeps the stability there. The U.S. and the Russians know this. They are, trust me on this, they are working together. There is communication between the Russian military and the United States military. They are in cahoots. They are in cooperation. Remember the article that was leaked years ago by Seymour Hirsch. Remember that, Dave? Right? Yeah. yeah. By Cy Hirsch. He, he, he leaked the information. It was called the Pentagon Papers. What was the Pentagon Papers? It was basically the U.S. DOD, the Department of Defense, leaking information to the Russians, letting them know, hey, ISIS is here. Hey, yeah, the, the rogue elements in our government has funding ISIS, training ISIS, providing material support for ISIS. The money is also coming from the Saudis. Here's their nest attack. Let's coordinate on stopping it. That's the beauty of see, so the, 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 the real evidence, the real evidence time and time and time again is when you get behind the, 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 the hoopla and you get behind the hype, you get behind the rhetoric, you actually see there's a lot of coordination that occurs. There is a lot of coordination. And I think, you know, it's too early to freak out. Let's just stay calm. Uh, let's move on to cryptocurrency and the economy. Uh, let's start off with cryptocurrency. We've seen Bitcoin, the price of Bitcoin has come down quite a bit. And then it kind of drove a lot of the other uh, coins down with it. And we see that, you know, it's it bobs up, it bobs down. Is this being manipulated in some way? Oh, yeah. The way they, the, the, the way they do it is, I mean, they can't manipulate it to the, the full ordeal as they do with gold and silver uh but what happens is that you know a lot of the bitcoin a lot of the btcs owned by uh some private individuals uh some private institutions that that have gotten in early uh in the, into the crypto space and what they're doing is uh they're manipulating it through the uh th through the exchanges by you know dumping it here and there and then buying it on the, you know, as it as the price dips, it, it you know, the, the the money or the wealth or the Bitcoin or the cryptos move from the weaker hands to the stronger hands, and they're buying it up. They're buying it up. So uh, I can tell you from somebody who works in the, you know, uh, the crypto space. You know, we have our trading room. It's a trader's market. Uh, a lot of people, if you're just a holder and you're missing out, you're like, oh, I missed the whole thing. I want Bitcoin was twenty thousand dollars. Now it's around six thousand nine hundred or seven thousand bucks, and oh, I'm all depressed. There's no point for me to get involved. But you know, every day there are people in our trading room, Dave, um, and you know that are killing it. In fact, you know we have an affiliate program with X22 Report. Folks can go on there. It's a trader's market. We've had people that have quit their day jobs and they're trading cryptos. There's so much money to be made in trading. But what the traders love is volatility. But I will tell you right now, Dave, that's the trading aspect of crypto. It's doing great. But the, we also work on the OTC market. The OTC is the over-the-counter. So when we have a large whale, Dave, when we have a large whale come through and he wants to dump his Bitcoin, right, or he wants to sell it off because he wants to take a profit, he wants to sell it off, he's not going to go to an exchange. He's not going to go to Coinbase or Kraken or any one of these other exchanges and, and, and try to sell his Bitcoin, because what's going to happen is you have what's called slippage, okay, where if he's got 100,000 Bitcoins, if he's trying to dump it, he's trying to sell it off, as he's onloading onto the platform, it's causing the price of Bitcoin to dip. So he doesn't want that. So he's going to be losing money by the time he offloads everything. He's going to, he's going to be at a loss. So he doesn't want to do that. So a lot of the large whales, and, you know, we deal with them. You know, we're, you know, we've been dealing with clients who have 300,000 Bitcoins, not $300,000, but 300,000 Bitcoins. So each Bitcoin is about 6,000, almost, let's say it rounded up $7,000 a piece. So 300,000 of those. Five, and we're talking about billions of dollars here, Dave. Another client, 500,000 Bitcoins. And these clients are moving, and we're involved in the process of getting these things liquidated and getting it done and, and you know, setting up the buyer, seller, the escrows. There's a lot happening, and I can tell you right now, folks, okay, when you get out of the world of, 
of let me see what's going on with Bitcoin news and cryptocurrency news. Blip, 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 blip. You go to such and such website. Yeah, you're not getting the full picture. It's when you're behind the scenes like what we're doing and we're seeing, you know, 100,000 Bitcoins come through, uh, 300,000, 1 million Bitcoins coming through on a platform to, to get liquidated, to buy and sell. You see the movement of buying and selling. They're buying and selling. You know, a guy comes in, he wants to sell 100,000 Bitcoins, and he has a buyer right there. We have buyers buying 10, 20, 30,000 Bitcoins a day. A day. 30,000, not $30,000, folks. 30,000 Bitcoins. Do the math in your head. That's over a billion dollars. It's just asinine amount of money, Dave, right? So right. you're seeing all this stuff happen, and you're like, wow, the crypto market is a lot more robust and extremely liquid than what a lot of people think it is. Like when you go to the OTC world, Oh my God, the amount of liquidity that is sloshing around there will make you puke. Okay. So cryptocurrencies, look, let's be honest here. We don't need 2000 cryptos. I think 98% of these cryptos are not going to exist in the next few years. I think most of them that wrote these wonderful, you know, fantasy Star Trek filled type white papers trying to get their ICOs done, those guys are done. And I look, BTC is 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 doing what it's supposed to be doing, which is it's starting to be number one a store of value. Number two, it is a it, it, it's it, it's you know especially with the new Lightning Network that's going to be uh, fully adapted by Bitcoin and start utilized. Uh, it's going to be a faster means of exchange uh, you, eventually, you know. And there's also other amazing cryptos that are alt or what people call altcoins that are coming up. That you know, people in our trade room, Dave, and people in the X22 trade room that 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 you know that we help with, that we're involved with, uh, you know, they're they're like certain platforms, like uh, like like you know, certain altcoins and exchanges and ICOs that have that have done where people have doubled and tripled their money. There's always money to be made, folks. Okay, people have this idea. Well, folks, here's the deal: the greatest fortunes in history have always been made in economic downturns the greatest fortunes okay the the millionaires and billionaires of tomorrow will be made by the bear markets of today the volatility of today the things that cause most people to to lose their lunch and lose their sleep that's what makes that's what separates the rock stars from the groupies and right now, it's a trader's market on the front end. It's a trader's market. If you know how to trade cryptos, if you don't know how to trade cryptos, come on in with our trading group. We have an X22 trading group uh, specifically for X22 clients. You can make r- ridiculous money. Uh, and and to be honest with you, it's, 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 it's on the long-term play. Cryptocurrencies are great to have. And Dave, we're going to soon be offering on on you know on, on our website liquidbase.io. Um, people will be able to buy gold, silver, and Bitcoin together. So if you got five hundred bucks, you can buy five hundred dollars worth of bit you know Bitcoin, silver, and and and, and gold. Wow! It, it, you know, so you you'll have it, and we'll ship it directly to your to the front door of your house, and the Bitcoin will be on a. On a, on, a, on a paper wallet, but the paper wallet, of course, is going to be in blows and it's going to be like on a plastic credit card with a Bitcoin wallet address, your own uh, private key code. And we'll send it to you. You'll have it. It's yours. OK, so uh, pretty amazing things uh, that are happening. So, um, yeah, it's a great time. Cryptos are great. It's, it's not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere, folks. It really isn't. I mean, with the crypto market, are, are the central bankers, are they still worried about the, the cryptocurrency becoming maybe a local currency? Because we see other countries are, are looking at it and, you know, they're, they're starting to use it. Yeah. I mean, let's put it this way. The second most used, the second most popular currency in Japan, which is the third largest economy in the world and the second biggest uh, equities market on the planet, um, the cryptocurrency, the I'm sorry, the, the the second most popular currency in Japan is Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the most popular currency, the second most widely used currency in Japan apart from the yen. So yes, and there's also regional currency. There's there's ideas that people want to like. For instance, there's a there's a um, cryptocurrency called Ven 
that from what I'm hearing is a lot of the 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 Chinese mega cities they want to start incorporating Venn as a as a as a tokenized way of payment for a bunch of different you know products and services within that local city. So this is the kind of things that uh, governments and central bankers are 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 terrified of, and I think it's a trend that they are trying to control, but in the long term, I don't think they can control it because things are becoming more and more decentralized. Yeah, I agree. I, I wanted to move up, uh, move into uh, the economy here and talk about, you know, the GDP numbers. We're seeing like, you know, 4% or higher. The economy, according to Trump, is doing fantastically. I mean, why is he out there pointing to the stock market, telling us the economy is doing great? I mean, has anything really changed in the way we calculate these things or what's really going on? I mean, what's what's the plan here? I mean, is is the economy really all of a sudden doing that much better? No, I think it, it's, it's political talk talk man it's political talk because let's be honest here the average american does, doesn't understand what a stock market bubble is right i mean let's be honest here the average american when he, when he, when he turns on mslsd or when he turns on cnbs or any one of these uh these business news shows right they're told numbers of oh it's in the millions it's in the billions it's in the trillions millions billions trillions millions billions trillions trillions billions millions all over and over and over and again the problem is we don't have any quantifiable measure. Measure, so we're just thinking on that too. Oh, debt's only twenty trillion. <laughs> Big deal. <laughs> most people don't understand this, and that's why I like to put it in in, in terms of time. And I always tell most all, all people this: How much is a million seconds? A million seconds is is twelve days. How much is a a, a billion seconds? And people are like, oh, I don't know what thirty days. No, it's thirty two years. How much is a trillion seconds? Uh, 50 years? No, it's 300 years. So that kind of brings people into scope. So the average American doesn't understand, hey, you know what, the, 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 they, they don't understand that, hey, you know what, the, the stock market is a bubble. And they don't understand why it's in a bubble. They don't understand the causation of of the bubble they have no clue about it they don't understand that our gdp numbers are cooked that the real accounting has been re-engineered back in the early 80s that they don't understand the fact that hey you know what there's still 95 million americans that are permanently unemployed they don't understand the fact that there's 42 million that are on food stamps they don't understand the fact that there's still about 100 million that are receiving some sort of government handout a welfare program of some sort and they don't understand that like um what is it, like three of out of every five kids in America over about – actually, no, it's about 25 to 30 percent of children in America go to sleep every night with food insecurity. They don't understand those numbers because everybody's you know, in on the phantom numbers because we have a phantom wealth effect. Right, so if Trump came out and be like, "Hey guys, here's the real deal about the economy. It sucks. It 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 it, it really blows. It's crappy. It's it's horrible. You know." There's nothing that we can be done, that can be done about it, okay? Uh, if 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 he were to come out and say those things, Dave, then what's going to happen? He's going to crush sentiment. Why? Because economy is not only de- dependent for it's not only dependent upon uh, let's say real physical labor and a real physical economy with real production and real output, but it's also dependent upon emotions, and we're still a consumer economy. So if you were to come out and say, hey, the economy sucks, it's terrible, the stock market the points will drop, everybody will get depressed, it will cause a lot more havoc. So people need to feel good. Then use the momentum of the bubble to actually start infrastructure projects and start building out manufacturing, start start implementing a real physical economy. That's what people don't understand. See – this is why I said people need to get out of dogma and get into pragmatism. If Trump, see, a, a smart person, if Trump's smart, he looks at the bubble and he says, okay, well, this is a freaking bubble. He knows it's a bubble, right? People all oh, look, he flipped the script. Now he's saying the bubble's good. He's saying the stock market is good. That's a sign of wealth. He He knows it's fake, but he cannot tell you how fake it is because, you know what? He doesn't want to crush the bubble yet. But he's trying to use the bubble, okay, number one, the, the phantom wealth effect. It has its uses, all right? It has its uses. 
you create the bubble, but at the same time, what is he doing, Dave? He's cutting regulations. He's reducing taxes. He's making this country, again, the most attractive country in the world to invest in. And what's happening? He's trying to bring back business. There's over $10 trillion offshore that are slowly starting to leak back in. He's doing that by, by creating what? The power of sentiment, the power of emotions, the power of perception, the power of mass group things, saying, hey, you know what? Wow, things are great. I actually feel good about myself. Oh, look, the phantom economy just gave me more fiat currency in my weekly paycheck. Oh, the phantom economy helped my 401k go up uh, 25%. Oh, I'm happy about that. The average Joe needs that. Because when he sees the good, positive feelings that he's getting, and now the regulations are being cut, they're being trimmed, and now physical, what is he doing? He's tr- Trump is not, look, the good guys will pull the rug on the fictitious economy. I know that for a fact. It's going to happen. But we cannot pull the rug right now until we get all these, regu- these regulations out of the way, number one. And number two, we actually start building out and ramping up a physical economy. And I think that's the key here, folks. That's the key. So until that physical economy is really pumping and jumping and now people are saying, hey, you know what? Uh, I'm feeling good. Yeah, that factory down the road, I'm going to go invest in it. I'm going to see the the people with money need to feel good as well. The people in Wall Street, the investors, I'm not talking about the the, the criminals that are running Goldman Sachs or, or JP Morgan or anything like that, but I'm talking about the investors who have a you know four hundred thousand, a million, two million, fifty million, a hundred million sitting in a in a trading account will look at oh that business venture over there. I'm going to go invest in private equity. I'm going to go invest in private ventures. That's how you grow the economy. But you can't do that if you're going out there saying the economy sucks and blows. It's it's garbage. It's going to crash tomorrow. <laughs> then you know what did you do to the country? You stonewalled it. You cannot cut your nose to spite your face. And that's what people need to understand. Guys, this is about being pragmatic. Let's be smart here. That's what the game is. I mean, is his end game to go after the Fed and and the central banks? Yeah, they'll be done away with. You, You cannot build a physical economy and have a central bank that's out of control. The goal is, from what I'm hearing from the murmurings, is to bring the Fed under the control of the Treasury. So basically, we're going to take control of the Fed, and it will long, no longer be a, a separate corporation. Correct. It will not be a private bank with 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 private aspirations, goals, and desires that are completely anathema and diametrically opposed to the country from which it is sitting in. That's going to get done away with. So wh- um, I don't want to. I don't want you to give me a specific time here, but. I mean, is this going to happen within the, his first term or if he gets elected for the second term? Is it going to happen within his presidency? Yeah, I think it will, yeah, I think it will definitely happen in his presidency. I think it's going to happen by the, the second term. I think that's I think that's what we're looking at. I think, uh, you know, step by step, things are moving in the right direction. I mean, geez, you know, I, you and I know what the hell is really going on in the economy. But damn, you talk to the average Joe on the street, he's, he's more. He's more elated than ever. He's he's completely happy. You talk to guys who own businesses. You talk to guys who own construction companies. You talk to guys. They're all happy. They're all hiring. Dave, I'm seeing more and more now hiring signs all over the place, starting 17 25 15 bucks, 18 bucks, 20 bucks. I mean, there are guys right now making 100 hundred uh, k or uh, almost $200,000 a year right now. Uh, and they can't fill the positions in the, in the Texas oil fields, uh, in the, in these various natural gas areas, in these energy companies, and these energy firms that are hiring. They can't get enough people in for high paying salaries. It's to the point where where they're they're even asking, hey, you don't even need experience. We'll train you. I've never seen that before. Why? Because they believe in the sentiment. Belief is a powerful thing. The emotion. Do not underestimate the power of emotion. It is a powerful thing and is a powerful driver in the game that we call economics. I agree with you.